Hello, it's Ryan. This is our first example that really we've kind of done in the class now. Uh, so I'm going to take my time with this and show you all the little things that I'm looking for. And what you're going to need to remember is that all these steps that we're doing are going to be necessary for you to replicate in your problem solving. Uh, it will help in the end, even though it may seem like a lot now. Anyway, this is our first example. This is a one-dimensional motion example. We'll have, I think, two. Well, technically three, but... And in this example, we're going to have uh, a Porsche. So we'll say uh, Jesse's Porsche. No, just, yeah, we'll have it be Jesse. Why not? No, let's have it be Sammer. I have a buddy named Sammer. So Sammer's Porsche. Sammer's Porsche has the ability to accelerate. Six point zero meters per second squared when the car is traveling nine meters per second. And so we're going to have a couple parts to this. A, what we're going to do is we're going to assume, so we'll say assuming Sammer is going 20 miles per hour. Assuming Sammer is going 20 miles per hour and then accelerates for 10 seconds, we're going to determine his velocity at the end of the acceleration interval. We're going to determine his velocity at the end of the acceleration interval. And B, we want to determine the total displacement that he went during that acceleration interval. Determine Sammer's displacement during the acceleration interval. So that's our problem. And like I said, I'm going to walk us through every step of this. The first step to any problem that you have, especially in physics and especially in a class that I'm grading you, is you should draw a picture. So we're going to draw a picture. And so we'll have the road. What you'll find out soon is that my cars kind of all look the same, and they always look like boots, but here they are. So this will be Sammer's Porsche. And we know that eventually we'll get up over here somewhere. I'm going to make Sammer's ghost Porsche, maybe. There it is. And we should label everything that we're given. And we're not going to put numbers in our picture. We're going to use letters. So there's some initial velocity, V sub O. And there's going to be a final velocity, V final. And if you look, I was kind of careful. I tried to draw my final velocity vector longer than my initial velocity vector because we're told in the problem that Sammer's going to accelerate with some positive acceleration. And so we could label that maybe right here marks Sammer's initial position, and right here marks Sammer's final position, and that means that from here to here is our displacement vector. We should also show that the Porsche is accelerating, A, and we'll do that with a vector as well. Uh, what way is the velocity changing? That's all an acceleration is, is a change in velocity. Well, obviously, if we're accelerating in a positive value and our final velocity is going to be larger than our initial velocity, then the change in velocity has to be to the right. And so our acceleration has a vector that's going to the right as well. 
And so this motion is all in one dimension. It's the horizontal dimension. Usually we call that the x-axis. But this is a nice picture. We could also label that we're going to start our clock here, t sub o, and t final would be at the end of the acceleration interval. Once you have a nice picture like this, you should probably spend the time to show your knowns and unknowns. So we're given some things in this problem. We're given that v sub o is 20 miles per hour. And what direction is it? Well, it's in the x direction. The way that we can label that the quickest is with the little i hat, our unit vector that represents the x direction. So now I've represented v sub o as a vector because that's what it is. We were given a. a was 6 me uh, meters per second squared in the x direction. We were given delta t delta t, which is t final minus t initial, and that was 10 seconds. And we're looking for v at the end, or at the end of the 10 seconds. So maybe actually instead of writing v final, we could write v at t equals 10 seconds. That equals, well, we don't know. And we also are wondering what s is, the displacement. So we've written our knowns and unknowns. It kind of helps guide us along the way. It also should ideally help us have from having to reread this over and over again. We can just reference our picture and our knowns and unknowns now. So that's really the major first step of a problem solving of, of your problem solving in this class. Now we have to use the big three whenever we're trying to solve a motion problem like this. And so I'm just going to jot the big three down so we can remember what they are. We have s equals 1 half a t squared plus v sub o t plus s sub o, the displacement equation. We have the velocity equation. And we have our time independent equation. That is the big three in all its glory. And so what we can do now, maybe our first step using the big three, uh, we can go ahead and input any zeros that there may be from our knowns and unknowns. Well, here's the thing that uh, you got to keep in mind. We get to make some decisions here. When we talk about an initial position, and a final position, what we're really doing is we're deciding where our number line lives or where our zero point will be. We could say that SAMR starts somewhere over here at zero, but then we would have to keep track of a new variable. What we're really interested in, according to the problem, is once SAMR starts to accelerate. And so we might as well say when this acceleration is going on, once that starts at t equals zero, we should probably start our position at zero as well. So we could note that s sub o and t sub o are going to be zero. But again, we're making that choice, but we might as well choose something that makes our life easier. Once we choose a zero point, we have to stick with it for the rest of the problem. Anyway, we're looking for the velocity after 10 seconds first. That's what part A is looking for. And so looking at our big three, we should make a decision as to maybe which one seems most useful. Well, this equation has no velocity at time t in it at all. It just has the initial velocity, which is constant. And so that might not be very useful. This equation has the velocity that we're looking for. It's the, v, it's the v squared. But it also has s 
in there that we don't know yet. And so this equation might not be the best equation to use. We have two unknowns right now. But what about the velocity equation? That one, we are given a, we're given t, and we're given v sub o, so the only unknown is the thing we're looking for. So it looks like we should use this first. Now I want you to keep in mind, I didn't come into this with like, well, I, obviously I did come into this with prior knowledge of the problem, but if I were you solving this, I would have written all three of these equations, no matter what the problem said, and then I would have used my knowns and unknowns to pick through which one might be the most useful. That's going to take a little practice, but you're always going to start the same way. We only have these to work with, so don't let it intimidate you. So we'll say using the time in, or I'm sorry, using the velocity equation. And all I'm going to do first, and this is an important first step, so you wouldn't have to write this, the, orange, the stuff I write in orange, you don't have to really write in your homework, but I just want to put it out there now because, again, this is our first problem we're solving. So the first step we're going to use is we're going to write the general form of the equation that we want to use. So step one for mathematically solving problems in this class is write the general form. So that's v equals at plus v sub o. Now this step is kind of lost in this, but I'm going to write it anyway. Two, we need to do any algebraic manipulation. So in other words, we need to solve, solve for the desired quantity. Well, in our case, it's already solved for, isn't it? So we don't really have to do a step two here, uh, but normally you probably have to do a little, or a little more than a little, algebra. Three. Sorry, three. We need to substitute our values. So something you should note to yourself is you always need to use the units if you're going to substitute values. So we know that uh, v equals a, which was 6 meters per second squared, times t, which was 10 seconds, plus, and v sub o was 20 miles per hour. Oh, uh, let's make a note before we come back to this uh, let's make a note here. We're going to drop vector notation, uh, and we're going to say, since this is all in the x direction, so it's one-dimensional, and so we know in the end if we need to add vectors in, they'll just be in the x direction. Okay. So if we were to try to solve this, we would be adding something that's in meters per second, if we multiply meter per second squared times a second. When we multiply, it's like multiplying straight across, and so our second squared and our second will turn this into meter per second, which is good, but we don't, how do you add a meter per second to a mile per hour? Well, we can't. This is why units are so important. And so we need to first, we need to convert, we need to convert 20 miles per hour to meters per second. So normally I would just have you do this, but we're going to do it the long way because you can convert any set of units using this method. We're really going to just multiply 20 miles per hour by a fancy 1 times 1 because it will equal the same thing. Now I know that sounds ridiculously silly and simple, but 
one can be written in a lot of different ways. We could write one as one star over star. And a star, oh my gosh, well, the stars better look the same. Or we could write it as three over three. Or we could write it as a million over a million. They all mean the same thing. And so instead, what instead of saying a fancy one, what we're really going to do is multiply by a conversion factor. They all mean the same thing. And so we'll go one step at a time to convert miles per hour to meters per second. So let's go. 20 miles over one hour. We're going to multiply by a fraction. Let's get rid of miles first. In order to get rid of miles, which is on the numerator, we need to divide by miles on the denominator. And we're trying to convert to meters. And I'll tell you what, there's 1609 meters in one mile. Now we're going to multiply by another fraction because, as you can see, we've now turned our miles to one and we're left with meters like we needed. So now we need to get rid of hours, so I'm going to put hours on the numerator. And we want to get seconds. Well, there's really, we could do two times. We could do minutes, then seconds, but there's 3,600 seconds in one hour, 60 times 60, right? So that will get rid of, it will turn our hours to one, and we'll be left with meters per second as we needed. If you were to multiply all this out, what would you get? I'll bet you it ends up being nine meters per second. It's probably not exactly, but we're going to use that. Okay, so back to our substitute values step. We want to use the same unit, so we have V equals... And we had 6 times 10, so we have 60, and it was meters per second, plus, and we have 9 meters per second. Remember, this came from right here. And so V at T equals 10 seconds is equal to 69 meters per second. Ah, but it's a velocity. The problem asked us for a velocity, and so we need to give the direction as well. So we could write this with the cute little i hat. You also could write this... Sorry about that. You also could write this with the magnitude and direction. Remember, zero degrees is our horizontal. Maybe you defined this direction in your problem as east. You could write east then. Whatever you want, as long as you give the magnitude and direction. This is the easiest way, probably. But that answers part A. And I always, by the way, finishing our orange write-up, this is step four where we had step three, substitute values, step four is the final answer. And I like to box mine in. It's good if you indicate your final answer. So step four, again, is, a, is the final answer. <clears throat> That's it for part A. Part B... Uh, part B was asking us to determine the displacement. Displacement. And so it looks like we can really use either of these equations, can't we? Uh, we could solve the displacement equation, or we could solve the time-independent equation. It looks like we know everything there is to know. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just use the time-independent equation just for funsies. So B, we're looking for the displacement. And so uh, let's say using the time-independent equation, we could show that V squared equals 2A delta S plus V sub O squared.
So now we get to, that's our general form. Remember, we're not usually writing the orange in here, but I'm just reminding you that uh, this is the steps that you should always take when you're solving problems in our class. So we have the general form. Now we need to do any algebraic manipulation. This time we actually have to do it. We need to solve for delta s. So I'm going to subtract v sub o squared by both sides and then divide by 2a. So I'll have v squared minus v sub o squared divided by 2a, and that equals delta s. That's our algebraic manipulation. Next, we need to substitute values. And so we're going to go ahead and say delta s equals, and we're going to put in v final was 69 meters per second squared minus v sub o was 9 meters per second squared and we're going to divide by 2 times a, which was 6 meters per second squared. Uh, so if we were to work this out, uh, we would see that delta s equals 390. And now we need to do a unit. Let's just do a unit check and see if our, if our algebra worked out. We have meters per second squared divided by meters per second squared. That sounded weird. But we need to square these first, so this will become meters squared per second squared divided by meter per second squared. And when we divide, we multiply by the reciprocal, right? Remember that? And so our second squared turned to 1, and our meter squared turned this meter to 1, and we're left with just meters, which is good. And this displacement was in the x direction, so I'm going to go ahead and give that as our final answer. So that was the first real problem that we've solved in one-dimensional kinematic motion. Uh, and the problem-solving method we used is something you want to kind of stick to for the rest of the class, so always start with a picture do your knowns and unknowns, and then we can start to work with our formulas with this one through four step formula uh, work through or whatever. Anyway, the point is try to adhere to this. You don't have to label the uh, general form and all this stuff every time. I'll be able to see that that's what you're doing in your work. I just wanted to make it very clear for these first set of notes. I'll do another example in a separate video for one-dimensional motion.